671. Okay, 8 o'clock. Right. So we start. We have to read it. Good. So who has a text? Everybody has a text? No, I don't have life divine. Okay. In that case, Sunki can read. Yes. It is clear that a mind of the nature of our surface intelligence can only be a secondary power of existence, for it bears the stamp, the stamp of incapacity and, ign and ignorance as a sign that it is, it is a derivative, derivative and not the original cre creatrix. We see that it does not know or, under, or understand or understand the objects it perceives, it has no automatic control of them. It has to acquire a, lab, a, a, laboriously, a laboriously built knowledge and controlling power. This initial incapacity could not be there if these objects were the mind's own structures, creations of its self-power. It may be that this is so because Individual mind has only a frontal and derivative power and knowledge, and there is a universal mind that is a whole, endowed with omniscience, capable of omnipotence. But the nature of mind as we know it is an ignorance seeking for knowledge. It is a knower of fractions and worker of divisions, striving to arrive at a sum, at a sum to piece, to piece together a whole. It is not possessed of the essence of the essence of things or their totality. A universal mind of the same character might know the sum of its divisions by force of its universality, but it would but it would still lack the essential knowledge. And without the essential no, essential knowledge, there could be no true integral knowledge. A consciousness possessing possessing the essential and integral knowledge proceeding from the essence to the, to the whole and from the whole to the parts, would be no longer mind, but a perfect truth consciousness automatically possessed of inherent self-knowledge and world knowledge. It is from this basis that we have to look at the subjective view of reality. It is true that there is no such a thing as an objective reality independent of consciousness, but at the same time, there is a truth in objectivity, and it is this, that, that the reality of things resides in something that is within them and is independent of the interpretation of our mind gives to them and of the structures it builds upon its observation. These structures constitute the mind's subjective image or figure of the universe. But the universe and its objects are not a mere image or figure. They are, in essence, creations of, con creations of consciousness, but of a consciousness that is one with being, whose substance is the substance of the being, and whose creations, too, are of that substance, therefore real. In this view, the world cannot be purely subjective creation of consciousness, the subjective and the objective truth of things are both real. They are two sides of the same reality. So, the chapter is the reality and the integral knowledge. He is trying to find the reality. We have seen already uh, that it depends on which level of consciousness you are at. And depending on that, you see the reality according to that standard. So he is trying to find out where is the ultimate reality. So he is examining one by one, one by one, and he is coming to, and each level, there is a theory. Because every time man reaches that level, he um, gives a theory because he feels that that is the ultimate reality. <clears throat> Okay, so what I'll do, I'll read the summary so that we get the gist of what he's saying. Then we'll go sentence by sentence. In the previous para, I'm reading now the summary which I have made. So don't look at for the text. Just you have to listen to it. Only. After that, when we start reading each one, 
then I'll tell you. In the previous para, we saw that the power of creating real forms belongs only to the super mind. The creative power changes its nature as it descends towards the manifesting world. So, the human mind is a creator. But what it creates are only representative images which can be seen as illusions or real and real images. Real and real, huh? sometimes they are half reality. For instance, the half reality examples are very easy. The rainbow is a half reality. Okay? Because when you go there, there is no rainbow. It's a it's an optical illusion. Okay. Then the shadow also. You can never the shadow is a conditional reality. It's not a real reality. Then the blue of the sky. Okay, there is no blue in the sky, but you still see that. So it's real or unreal, depending at which level you are. Okay, so <coughs> then, but what it creates are only representative images, which can be seen as illusions or real unreal images, which could be called conditional realities. So we may say that the supermind is a fundamental primary creatrix and the individual mind is a derivative secondary creator. I'll discuss this point a little more, then we'll see. How can the mind be a creator? Okay, just think about it. Has it not created the mobile? Has it not created the TV? Has it not created instruments? It's a mind that does it. So the mind is a creator. But the only difference between the supreme creator and the mind mental creator is this, that the mind creator or creatrix rather, is using materials which already exist in the world. Okay, When I am creating a mobile, I am using metal which already exists in the world. But when the superman is creating, it is creating the material itself also. Okay, So that's the only difference. Okay? This is because superman is already descended into the domain of ignorance and multiplicity by the time it has reached the level of the individual mind. This incapacity of the individual mind is only a small part of the universal mind which has a vision of the whole, but it does not have the essential knowledge. So we have then a series of three steps. Okay, I'm reading the summary of what he said. We have then a series of three steps. The first of all, the individual mind is in ignorance and sees only parts. Second, the universal mind sees the whole, but lacks the essential knowledge. Third, the supermental has the interior vision and also the essence of all knowledge. Okay, so you got the gist? So let's see this. Now, it is true that there is no such thing as objective reality, independent of consciousness. It is only consciousness that is seeing the reality. If there is no consciousness, there is no reality for you. It is consciousness that is seen. But it is also true that there is an objective reality that is behind the apparent superficial forms. This is a secret and hidden reality which the individual interpretative mind cannot see. What it meant is that behind the TV, behind the pen, behind the mobile, there is a reality, but that reality is permanent, but you don't see it. You are seeing only the outer form, and that is not the reality, because it will disappear. Okay? So, <clears throat> this is a secret, or if you want, you can call it the divine presence in everything. That is permanent, and it is there behind every form. This is a secret and hidden reality, which we can call the divine presence, which the individual interpretative mind cannot see. The individual mind creates images which cover the inner objective reality of all forms and these form images are fleeting, transient and therefore could be considered as unreal. Okay. <clears throat> now, but the universe is created by the supermind where consciousness and force use their own substance 
to create cosmic forms and therefore they are real. At the supramental level, subject and object merge into one single reality. Knowledge, knower and known are all one. But it subdivides itself into the lower part and becomes separated. The individual mind reaches the self and sees the world as subjective forms. But the supermind sees the world as within itself, subject and object have become one. This is the summary of what he is saying. Okay. Now we will go and read each sentence. Keep that in mind. It is clear that a mind of the nature of our surface intelligence, so what is that? The normal human being and his mind. It is clear that a mind of the nature of our surface intelligence can only be a secondary power of existence. Okay? The primary power of existence is the super mind. Because that is the end. Now, Sergei is still using, for our mind also, he is using an M cap. Now, why is that? Because it is the same mind that operates from the highest level to the lowest level. Even the <coughs> physical mind, okay? Even the physical mind is really mind principle at the highest level, which has reduced itself, diminished itself because of manifestation. And it is there in this. That's why mind, the principle of mind at all the levels. That's why you use it and can. <clears throat> now, it is clear that a mind of this of the nature of our surface intelligence, surface intelligence, our what you can call even logical mind. Even there, at our level also, there are three levels. Physical mind, vital mind, and pure mind. So even the pure mind, which is capable of logical thinking and rational conclusions, okay, that also is nothing but a secondary power of existence. It creates, it does create, but it's a secondary power of creation. For it bears a stamp of incapacity and ignorance as a sign that it is derivative and not the original creatrix. Okay. We see that it does not know or understand the object it perceives. It has no automatic control of them. It has to acquire a laboriously built knowledge, which is science. Science has to build the knowledge of what it is seeing. Okay. And still, that also is not complete. It has to acquire a laboriously built knowledge and controlling power. To a certain extent, science can control the physical forms in the universe, but if control is not 100%. <coughs> we can use, but we don't make it do what we want. We can use these powers. Things. This initial incapacity could not be there if these objects were the mind's own structures. Okay. What do you mean by mind's own structures? Mind, our mind is utilizing the substance in the physical world. It is not its own. Okay. The mind is using metal to create a mobile. So it's not using its own power. Okay. It's not using its own material. The material of the mind at our level is a substance, there's no doubt, but it's very, very gross. Okay, compared to the subtle substance of the super mind. Very compared to that, very, very gross. Therefore, it's limited. Now, note this interesting fact. There is the creative power and there is the substance which it uses. Okay, so this idea also you must have clearly in your mind. And I will repeat, because all these ideas, we have to coalesce them together and comprehend them in a total way. So, Sat Chit Shakti Ananda is the highest level of consciousness. I am giving you the idea of substance. I am going into that. Okay. So now, just see, Sat is a substance which is absolutely subtle. Okay. Chit is consciousness. And consciousness has got power. And it also, when it is creating, it is using its own substance. Now note that. Okay. It is using its own substance. Whereas at our level, 
we are not using the substance of the mind. We are using the substance which is outside. Okay? We are using metal. We are using wood. We are using the mind is using wood to make furniture. That's fine. It's using a metal to make a mobile. It's not using its own material. But the super mind is using its own material. Okay. That's why it is saying that very clearly. You can see. Yeah? He's saying this initial incapacity of absolute creation, okay, it's, it's not capable of creating absolute, could not be there if these objects were the mind's own structures. In other words, the mind has got its own structure only at the supermental level, and therefore there is no incapacity there. But at our level, mind is not using its own uh, material, and therefore it is incapacitated. Okay? <laughs> Creations of its self power. It may be that this is so because individual mind has only a frontal and derivative power and knowledge, and there is a universal mind that is bold, endowed with omniscience. The universal mind is the mind principle incomplete, okay? and our mind is a small selection of the universal mind, and it is limited, therefore, it is not. It doesn't have omniscience. Okay? And if it has omniscience, it's got omnipotence. But our mind is not omniscient, and therefore it doesn't have omnipotence, but it has potency. It can create things, but in a secondary manner. Okay? But the nature of mind, as we know, as we know it, is an ignorance, seeking for knowledge. It's a knower of fractions and worker of divisions. Striving to arrive at a sum. All scientific knowledge and all uh, philosophical knowledge from the mind only is only a summation of parts. It is not the whole. It does not see the whole. Okay. <clears throat> seeing the whole is totally different from seeing the parts and gathering them together. Okay. Mind is analytical. But when you go into spiritual planes, then the analysis part is reduced. And the synthetic part increases. Okay. So, with <clears throat> uh, the nature of mind, as we know it, is an ignorance seeking for knowledge. It's a number of fractions, not full numbers. Okay. What you call integer. So, you have to call them fractions. We are saying only fractions. And workers of divisions striving to arrive at a sum to piece together a whole. It is not supposed of the essence. Oh, sorry. It is not possessed. Or the essence of things or their totality. What is the essence of everything? The essence of everything is such and So it does not possess that. Okay. So naturally it is, it has to be a creator, but of a very lesser order okay, of their totality. A universal mind of the same character might know the sum of its divisions by force of its universality, but it will still lack the essential knowledge, and without the essential knowledge, there would be no true integral knowledge. So, the three levels that we spoke about, level one, the individual mind. Level two, the universal mind. But that also, shall be saying, it may know the whole by summation, but it does not know the whole integrally. That's the universal mind. It corresponds to the spiritual planes of consciousness. When you go to the spiritual planes of consciousness, your knowledge increases like anything, but it's still not the ultimate. Okay. There's one more step to be taken for the ultimate. Okay. So that's why I call, I made a distinction between level one, level two, level three. This idea of level one, level two, level three is very important. It will give you a lot of clarity in thinking. <coughs> it is there in the Gita, it is there in the, um, the our scriptures, it is there also in uh, not so clearly defined, but is there also in Sri Ramadu. Every now and then he will talk of level and third level. Okay? So you will see that. Now, I go to the next sentence. A consciousness possessing the essential and interior knowledge, proceeding from the essence to the whole, and from the whole to the parts, would be no longer mind, but a perfect truth consciousness. Now, when he uses the word truth consciousness, he is talking about the super mind. 
Okay, so third level, automatically possessed of inherent self knowledge and world knowledge. It knows itself and it knows the world. Why? Because it is itself created the world and created itself. It is from this basis that we have to look at the subjective view of reality. It is true that there is no such thing as an objective reality independent of consciousness. Only if consciousness is there, there is a reality. Two things. You don't see the physical world if there is no consciousness at all. So at the lower level, the consciousness begins with a unicellular creature. So the reality will correspond to that level. Then you have a cat and a uh, dog. So the reality for it is what is subject to, to its senses. What is what is senses will permit it to see reality, it will think that that's reality. When we come to the human being, same thing. We are taking the objects that we see, although they are only superficial things, we take them to be reality. So it goes on like that up right up to the top level. So all these realities below the supermind are real and real forms. They are not absolutely real. I gave you examples of real and real forms. At that level, there is real, but ultimately you find that that's not as real as you thought it to be. But at the same time, there is a truth in objectivity, and it is this, that the reality of things resides in something that is within them and is independent of the interpretation of our mind, interpretation our mind gives to them, all of the structures it brings upon its observation. In other words, when I'm looking at a stone, I think that that's the reality, but it is not the reality. The reality is the divine presence hidden in the stone. Okay. That's what the sentence means. Okay. These structures, what are these structures? Forms in the universe. These structures constitute the mind's subjective image or figure of the universe. In other words, you are not seeing the reality, you are only seeing photographs, representations, symbols, and figures of the reality. They are not the reality. Okay. So they are, in essence, creations of consciousness, but of a consciousness that is one with being, whose substance is a substance of being, and whose creations, too, are that of substance. Therefore, real. that's the highest level. Okay. This, even the forms are unreal, but the reality behind the form is the reality. The, the sorry, the divine presence behind the form is the reality. In this view, the world cannot be a purely subjective creation of consciousness. The subjective and objective truth of things are both real. They are two sides of the same reality. That last sentence it means that what the Mayavadan is saying, that the physical world is unreal because he is seeing only the form of the stone. But if you have reached a level of consciousness which is like that of the supermind, then you see, you will see that behind the form there is a reality. And that is the reality of the universe, not the forms that you see. Okay? So the Mayavadan is right if he limits himself only to the surface of things. The surface of things is not the reality. But from a supermental point of view, their forms are only the surface of things, but there is a divine presence in everything that is the reality. That's what he's saying. Okay? So, we have got about 10 minutes, no, nearly 15 minutes, so we can read the next one. In a certain sense. So, who has a text? Sunki read the first one. We can now read the second one. Yeah, Kiran, you have the text? Yes, yes Okay, go ahead, read. In a certain sense. In a, term, in a certain sense, to use the relative and suggestive phrasing of our human language, all things are the symbols through which we have to approach and draw nearer to that by which we and they exist. The infinity of unity is one symbol. The infinity of the multiplicity is another symbol. 
again since each thing in the multiplicity points back to the unity since each thing that we call finite is a representative figure a form front a solute shadowing out something of the infinite all that defines itself in the universe all its objects happenings idea formations life formations are in their turn each a clue and a symbol to our subjective mind the infinity of existence is one symbol the infinity of non existence is another symbol the infinity of the inconscient and the infinity of the superconscient are two poles of the manifestation of the absolute parabrahman and our existence between these two poles and our passage from one to the other are a progressive ceasing a constant interpretation a subjective building up in ourselves of this manifestation of the unmanifest through such an unfolding of our self existence we have to arrive at the consciousness of its ineffable ineffable presence and of ourselves and the world and all that is and all that is not as the unveiling of that which never entirely unveils itself to anything other than its own self light eternal and absolute So he has actually summarized whatever he is saying. He is saying that the lowest level there is a only the unreality is there. The, if you see only superficially, it is unreal. But behind the unreality is a form that is a permanent reality. Okay. But because you are at this level, you are in ignorance. And as you keep mounting in consciousness, you are going nearer and nearer to the reality. And the reality is only at the summit. All the rest are only semi-reality, and this is a progression. This is the evolutionary ascent of consciousness. So that's basically what he said. So, having said that, it's not very uh, difficult. I'll just read out the summary of this one, and then we'll go to each sentence. I think we'll have the time. Okay. So, there is. I'm reading the summary. There is a reality of spirit which is absolute at the third level. Okay. There is the relative reality of the manifestation in the in the universe. In the universe, all forms originating from that supreme reality are representative of that ultimate reality. Okay. The example I give to the children usually is this ring. Okay, I am showing you the ring. Maybe you don't have the photo. No, the ring is a symbol of mother. But through that symbol, I can go to the mother by concentrating. Behind that symbol is the mother's presence. Okay, that's what he said. These forms are all symbols of the reality. Through these symbol forms, we can approach the reality. Each manifested form represents a corresponding reality. By the unveiling of these forms, we go to that reality. We have to go behind the form. And go to the reality, but that supreme self cannot be known except by its own consciousness. No mental consciousness can ever hope to know the supreme reality. Only it knows itself. That is the summary of what he is saying. Having said that, we will now look at each sentence. In a certain sense, I am reading the beginning of the paragraph. In a certain sense. To use the relative and suggestive phrasing of our human language, all things are the symbols through which we have to approach and draw near to that by which we and they exist. We exist only because such a thing is there. That's the thing. And just like as I said, the water in the tap. Is there only because there is a, a big water tank on the terrace? That is the reality, and the tap, the water coming out of the tap, is the uh, unreality because there are many many taps you can have. The multiplicity you can have. Or a better example is a bad example, <laughs> but a good example is the glacier and the river. Okay, 
the glacier is the permanent form, and if the glacier is not there, the river can't exist. So the super mind is the one that is the creator of all these forms, and these forms are real only because the super mind is there. That's what basically what we say. Okay, all things are symbols through which we have to approach and draw nearer to that by which we and they exist. The infinity of unity is one symbol. The infinity of the multiplicity is another symbol. Again, since each thing in the multiplicity points back to the unity, since each thing that we call finite is a representative figure, a form front, a silhouette, shadowing out something of the infinite, all that defines itself in the universe, all its objects, happenings, idea formations, life formations, are in their turn each a clue and a symbol. And through these symbols, you can go to the ultimate reality. To our objective mind, sorry, to our subjective mind, the infinity of existence is a symbol. The infinity of non-existence is another symbol. The infinity of the inconscient and the infinity of the superconscient are two poles of the manifestation of the absolute parabrahm. The infinity of the inconscient is below and the infinity of the superconscient is above. Okay? Both have, are only the same thing in a plus and minus manner, if you want. Okay? Are two poles of the same manifestation of the absolute parabrahm. And our existence between these two poles and our passage from one to the other are a progressive seizing and evolution. Okay? As we go on, we seize each level and understand and uh, get knowledge according to that level. That's important. A constant interpretation, a subjective building up in ourselves of that this manifestation of the unmanifest. Through such an unfolding of our self-existence, we have to arrive at a consciousness of its ineffable presence. That presence which cannot be spoken of, which cannot be known by the mind and of ourselves and the world. This ineffable presence is there everywhere. It's in ourselves and the world. And all that is and all that is not as the unveiling of that which never entirely unveils itself to anything other than its own self-light, eternal and absolute. Okay? <laughs> the reality cannot be known by anything other than itself. So you have to become what you want to know. And that is possible only at the highest level. Even in the second level of the spiritual planes of consciousness, there is a power of identification starts coming down. So partly you will know. And that is the reason why, although nobody has gone to the supermind yet permanently, you can know something of the supermind because it reflects itself in the lower level of consciousness. Okay? So that's what you see. We still have about seven minutes. And I don't know how big the next one is. Let us see how big the next one is. Uh, it can be read. Okay? We can read it. By this way of seeing. Okay. So, if anybody else has the text, we can. Yes, when you have the text? No, I'm no. sorry. Life divine, I don't have. Okay, okay. Then, uh, Archanadi is there also. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm reading it. I'm reading it. Okay, uh, go ahead. Yeah. But, this uh, but this way of seeing, right now? Yeah, that's it. But this way of seeing things belongs to the action of the mind, interpreting the relation between the being and the external becoming. It is valid as a dynamic mental representation corresponding to a certain truth of the manifestation, but subject to the proviso that these symbolic values of things do not make the things themselves mere significant counters, abstract symbols like mathematical formulae, or other signs used by the mind for knowledge. For forms and happenings in the universe are realities significant of reality. They are self-expressions of that, movements and powers of the being. Each form is there because it is an expression of some power of that which inhabits it. Each happening is a movement in the working out 
of some truth of the being in its dynamic process of manifestation. It is this significance that gives validity to the mind's <coughs> interpretative knowledge, its subjective construction of the universe. Our mind is primarily a percipient and interpreter, secondarily, secondarily and derivatively a creator. This indeed is the value of all mental subjectivity that it reflects in it some truth of the being which exists independently of the reflection. Whether that independence presents itself as a physical objectivity or a supra, supra physical reality perceived by the mind but not perceptible by the physical sense. Mind then is not the original constructor of the universe. It is an intermediate power valid for certain actualities of the universe. An agent and intermediary, it actualizes possibility and has its share in the creation. But the real creatrix is a consciousness and energy inherent in the transcendent and cosmic This is not a very big para. And again, he is saying more or less the same thing in different words. Okay, so I'll read the summary and we can stop here after that. So we have contrasted the supreme reality with the apparent realities of the objectivized forms in the manifested world. There is a contrast between them. At the highest level, there is absolute reality. At the lower level, there are relative realities which go on becoming more and more real as you keep climbing in consciousness. This is largely true. But would this mean that the objects of the physical universe are nothing but images and symbols without any real significance? That's what he's saying. Okay. So this would imply that science which leads which deals with the objects and events of the universe as though they are real, is making a fool of itself and deceiving itself. But it is not so. So it is saying that even the forms that you see in the physical world are representatives. Okay? Just like a photograph of, uh, let us say, Calcutta, okay, is not absolutely unreal. It is reflecting Calcutta in the photograph. Okay? So, the physical world is not absolutely unreal. Now, this is a very interesting thing because each thing in the universe, there is a corresponding reality on top which you call the archetype. Okay? And very interesting because how does one, I'll just make a little diversion, very interesting, just think about it. How does mother give significances to flowers? Precisely because each flower is a photograph of the reality which it represents. Okay, so what does mother do? She goes into the subtler field and sees the reality which that flower is picturing, which that flower is representing. So she can say, this flower champa is psychological perfection. And she say, the other one is smile. Okay, then this is how she will go on, goes to the subtler plane and sees the reality of the flower and tells you what it is. Now, I am talking only of flowers, but it applies to everything in the physical world. Just like, as I said, the ring, okay? Mother's symbol of the ring, through that, it can go to mother. So, these are not absolutely unreal, but there is a representative reality which is there behind the form. That's what he's saying. Behind each cosmic, I'm reading the summary, I'm continuing. Behind each cosmic object and event perceived by the senses, whether animal or human, as real, there is indeed a reality, an essentiality of the object or event. And when science deals with objects and phenomena as if they were real, it is justified because there's a reality behind the surface form. Science is, of course, not aware of this truth, but that does not seem to matter. The objects of the universe are then not mere unsubstantial shadows to the senses and the mind which conceive them as real. They are only images. The mortal mind does not cognize these hidden realities behind the surface forms. The human mind is then a derivative and secondary creator. The ultimate creatrix is the gnosis, the supramental, which uses these divine, its divine power of maya to manifest itself in the universe. This is what he is saying. Okay? 
and <coughs> you see we we smoke only on the uh, the flowers but we smoke of everything okay and that's a very interesting spin up and up because the human body itself is also if you think of the spine and the legs and the head you know you will see that the whole body is being directed and controlled only by the head and the head is the summit so everything in the physical world is being manipulated and managed by the super mind and everything right up to matter which are legs okay this is the reality so ram krishna had a very interesting example he said that judging from the features of the body okay you can say at which level of consciousness also he is there for as in the hands if they reach below the knees okay it means something i think buddha's image uh, sometimes they show them as the hands are reaching up to the knees so all these things in the physical world they have a, a reality which is hidden behind the form okay that's what we say okay so we stop here today i have crossed my again by 1 minute so what we read today was very interesting the mayavadan is saying that the physical world is unreal because he is seeing only the forms but shankar is saying wait wait don't be so much in a hurry but you to try and see the reality behind the form but for that you have to go to a higher level of consciousness that's all the gist of what he said okay so i stop here today and i bid everybody a very happy day have a nice day thank you angada thank you for